I'd like to invite our five speakers to the chairs here. Um, and for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll take questions from the floor before we get to the most important bit of the day, which is the drinks reception, where the proper conversations happen, don't they? Oh, do you want to go there and I'll sit here? Is that all right, James? Or do you want to take the questions? No. Yeah, if you want. <laughs> Depends on the question. <laughs> um, lady over here on the right. Hi. Um, I'm going to be the Cassandra of the day. My name is Jean Maxoli. I've worked for um, environment groups like Greenpeace and CORE, both here and overseas uh, on, as a campaigner and as a policy analyst on the nuclear industry. But I also used to be a member of the Federal Nuclear Safety Committee in Australia. At the time, uh, they first decided to try and get a license for a new reactor there. And it was the first reactor license in post 9-11. And I bring that up because the question I have for everybody on the panel, and this is the uh, very pessimistic bit, is that given the rapidly changing and increasing risks of a number of threats globally and nationally to a whole range of programs, I begin to doubt whether there will be the corporate and government control over the next 100 to 120, sorry, 100 to 200 years for a disposal program for legacy waste and new build waste if it ever happens. And now, as I say, it's a very depressing question, but I think it's one that has to be addressed so I'm asking for the views of the panel, please. Yeah, I'm sure it's one that everybody's been thinking about. There's so many variables when you're making plans for the next century or so. Juliet, maybe we'll start with you from a government perspective. How do you plan around those variables that make nothing concrete? Can I talk from a personal perspective? Yes. Yes, yes. I absolutely agree with you. I, I, dare I say it, we, we, we live in interesting times. And uh, I, I think any uh, procrastination in terms of resolving the, the challenge of radioactive waste management because we think there might be some better opportunity when, as we've been hearing, we have the technical solutions available to us now. Uh, we do at our peril because we cannot be uh, necessarily confident that we will always have the same governance and opportunities available to us that we have now. From a government perspective, we're very confident that actually we have now put in place a revised process certainly for securing a geological disposal facility. And I think having learnt, I'm sure not all, but certainly the majority of the lessons from the previous process we've had here in, in Cumbria, and I'm, I'm hearing certainly uh, a lot more willingness, both within government and indeed talking to industry, uh, to actually realise that there is a need to actually face up to radioactive waste management and to put in place arrangements that will deliver safe final disposal sooner rather than later, um, recognising those kinds of challenges, but actually also building on the fact that there are global opportunities for growth too. And you said that progress has been glacial. Isn't it necessarily so? Well, it is the case that, yes, we need to find a solution. Equally, it can't be rushed. Yeah, I must say I'm more on the pessimistic side here because... We do need to look at this question of timescales. And um, with the best will in the world, we're not going to get a repository, in my judgment, uh, that will start to receiving waste until well into the second half of this century. Um, and that repository uh, is only going to take the, the waste, that, the high level waste that we have now. There's still a huge amount of waste that will not be dealt with with that. And if we get new nuclear reactors, I, that they won't start discharging their wastes until uh, well into the next century. And I just ask you to look at the sites which are currently being um, identified. I represent the Bradwell site as a, as a protester against that. And one of the main reasons I'm against uh, the Bradwell site is the site is completely... Um, uh, an irresponsible place to put nuclear waste. And this is the case with a number of other sites. Um, however hard we try, there is a, there's a, there's a real long-term issue here, I think, uh, of, of proliferation and diversion, which is, which is the, the problem that, that Jean raises. But, I mean, let us not f think that, we've got, that this repository is, is the kind of final solution that's here and now. It's not. It's a long way off. And therefore, we've got to try and manage this stuff safely in places where it can be safe. 
and we're nowhere near doing that at the moment. And do you want to come back on that as somebody who's worked for an organisation where they have found a site that's been successful? I mean, I think, I think one of the things you've got to remember is you've got to start somewhere and you, you've got to start. I think the other aspect is that the repository itself is, is modular, as it were. You know, you, you're, you're not building the whole thing and then starting to fill it with waste. The idea is that you would build the infrastructure and have a vault and then you would start filling that with waste while you constructed the next vault, et cetera. So the, so the idea is it's a rolling modular aspect where you can seal off different parts of it at different times. And this, again, is what happens, for example, in WIP, um, in, in a facility that's already operational. So first of all, you've got to, you, you do have to start because I think, as Philippe um, put it, we do need to have a, a better uh, solution for dealing with the waste and uh, make it safer for, for future societies and future generations. And then retrievability and the whole modular aspect of it as what makes it flexible in terms of how you take it forward in the future. So, so I think whilst we are planning for what seems like decades ahead, um, I think there is a, an aspect that as it becomes more real, other, other people's programs have actually stepped up the pace as people have actually understood more what, what's involved. How does that fit in with the global picture? Because presumably, Philippe, every country has very different political social pressures on it when it comes to this. Yeah, but I can give you one example where the security issue has played a big role. We as the IA are uh, helping today Ghana and Malaysia to dispose of disused steel like radioactive sources because this is a bit of a special type of waste. They pose a bigger security threat than conventional radioactive waste. You can't go into a spent fuel storage and take away a bundle of spent fuel. But these radioactive sources are small and they can more easily be stolen and abused or used for, for bad purposes. So we get money from Canada and the United States to dispose of these sources in Ghana and Malaysia specifically because they pose, in the eyes of Canada and the United States, a security issue. Now, before you go home all in panic about these, re uh, these disused sources, they are kept in storage facilities safe today. But again, you cannot guarantee this, this securement over the next decades, and that's why it's better to dispose of these sources. So what you said indeed points in favor of a disposal facility, because in a disposal facility, from a security point of view, the waste is more secure than in a storage facility. And James, that chimes with what you were saying earlier, that the packaging and isolation of it is just as important as the disposal at the end. Yeah, I also want to add that um, to people to remember, we are disposing of radioactive waste in the UK right now. Um, so you know, we have to give that message across as well. So disposal is part of the, the waste management life cycle, which is being managed. And I also think, I. Uh, we haven't, none of us have got a crystal ball. I don't know what the world's going to be like 100 years from now. But I think what we need to focus on is what we can, can control. So the fact is actually getting on and building a good reputation, doing what we said we're going to do, package the, way, package the waste effectively, thinking carefully about the safety and security and environmental impact of what we're doing. And that reputational thing is really important about building confidence. So when we take this work forward, we're building that trust over time. So I think we have to remember we have to do a good, good job today to support the programme of the future as well. OK, let's take another question. Any over here? No? Any from gentlemen here? Thank you. Uh, Brendan Sweeney, New Leaf. Um, uh, I met the mayor of, of, of Osthammers in, in, in the summer. Um, uh, it, what struck me, and, and speaking to other European um, municipality leaders is Britain is notoriously poor at delegating power out from the centre. We're very, very heavily centre, government centred in Westminster, and particularly on financial matters. I'd uh, be just interested, in, probably from Anne, as to how much money um, the local government community in Sweden is getting directly, either through, um, uh, do they have a local income tax that's generating them more money from that employment? We all want to see more jobs in our community, but being from Barrett, we've got loads more coming over the last few years there. And I can tell you it's made damn all difference to our local government finances. I do suspect that in Sweden they've actually seen much more money on it and there is much more of an incentive to encourage local authorities to engage there with the GDF process and similarly with some of the other ones around the world than we've got in this country where financially there just aren't the incentives for the local authority as opposed to the local community. 
there isn't the direct money going to come from a GDF that there would be in other parts of, of Europe and the world. I'd be interested in your thoughts. It's an interesting point, isn't it? In countries where it's perhaps more of a federal system and less centralised, it's easier to sell it. Is that what you found in Sweden? Yeah, it is. I mean, effectively, they don't really have regional um, governments there. there. There is an awful lot of power which is down at the local level, the municipalities, as they call it. So their municipalities do have a lot more power and there's not much at the regional level. So they have like a two-tier system, sat national, and then the, um, the, the very much local. But I think that, and that's why... You know, you can't really directly import the experience from, from one place to another, other than maybe the lessons learned and actually picking up some of the, some of the tips, etc. But I do think that the one thing that they, they did do is they were able to use their imagination and be very creative about how they thought about what you might call leveraging opportunities um, and working on this added value aspect. So what they did is they effectively got the local uh, community people the developer and the developer's parent company in a room to actually have discussions about how they added value in terms of some of the um, projects that, for example, even the NDA are even involved in now, you know, those sort of actually perpetuating them more. And I think they had a lot more imagination and a lot more brain power went on to that to open up the possibilities and be a bit braver about asking, can we have this, can we do this, can we do that? But it had to be under the head heading of added value, not just oh yeah, that seems like a good idea, I'll give it to my brother-in-law sort of thing. It was, a, it was a very, you know, very well thought through system. Juliet, you don't work for the Treasury, so we'll not put pressure on you about uh, local government cuts, but do you think there's an argument to say more money does need to be put into the region? So if you're going to have a big open debate with communities, there needs to be the finance there to give the infrastructure. I, I, I think certainly there needs to be that added value conversation. Now, whether that's in the form of a benefits package, whether it's in the form of those other transformation opportunities, development of skills and capabilities in the local area, that allow them to grow in other ways and means. Uh, that's the conversation we absolutely need to be having. And I think, you know, more generally, when we think about radioactive waste management, a lot of the local authorities already, we ask an awful lot of them in terms of having the skills and the capabilities to advise on radioactive waste but actually without really giving them access to the resources and the skills to do that. So, again, I think we need, whether or not you're looking to host a geological disposal facility, th there needs to be some wider support given to those skills and capabilities okay. so that actually the planning regime right across the country, whether it's for geological disposal or indeed for other forms of waste management, uh, can actually be supported through the planning system. Mm -hmm. um, bottom line, James, is, is it sellable as a concept? Can it work? Um, what's interesting is I, I think we talk about waste management a little bit as a dirty word. Uh, what about trying to communities to recognise we could develop a world-class capability in terms of waste so management? So shifting the language like they have in Sweden. So the cell is a bit more yeah. is stronger in this respect. I mean, it's interesting, I am biased, I freely admit when it comes to waste management, but I hear that people are always interested in new build or different um, industries. Actually, the, the area of waste management is a really important one for the nation, and also the technological advances we can do there, we should be, should be shouting more about it, full stop. Nothing that will help. You can understand why, though, if it is sold as a, this is a great thing for your community. Communities may start to feel, Philippe, like they're being bought for something that actually isn't very pleasant for their environment. Well, yeah, some people would call it bribery, but mm. as uh, Anne pointed it out, it's not just giving a, a check and you can do what you want, it's about creating added value. And I can just refer to the only experience I have is from the Belgian program. And there the local communities had actually a say in the design of the disposal facility. So they were not just involved in terms of giving them benefits, they were actually involved in how we're gonna solve this technical scientific problem. And one of the things they wanted, for example, is that was one of my slides for the disposal facility they plan to build in Belgium. Underneath that facility is an inspection room. And that was a really, really pain for the, the way, for, for the, the engineers that had to design it because it's not so great from a safety point of view because that inspection room can fill up with water and that's not so great. You don't want that from a safety point of view. But the people still wanted it because they felt that room can give us the possibility to keep going and have a look underneath if there's anything wrong with that facility. So although that the regulator and the waste management organization didn't really want it, they had to find a way that still it could be done in a safe way. So we got around that. It, we built that inspector, or we plan to build that inspection room in a safe way. But the people feel 
involved because they wanted it and they got it. So it's not just about giving them money and then we do what we want. It's also really listening, are they happy with the plans we're developing? So okay. that's an aspect Do as you well. think, Andrew, it can, it can become a positive for a community if they sort of feel that they've taken ownership from it, they, they're a big part of it, they can feel like actually mm -hmm. they've won? I think, I think the problem is that we're talking about radioactive waste here. We've been around this circle many times as to what sort of compensation can you give, how can you make it attractive and so on, so that people positively want it. Now, in the Swedish case, which I do think, despite what Anne says, is a very distinctive case, they're all very distinctive. You had the, at the end, after a long period, and there was a lot of rejection going on in Sweden, if you go way back, you got a couple of communities uh, competing apparently for this facility but the the, the, the difficulty is that it that it is going to go to what I call peripheral communities the only people likely to want it are places possibly like Sellafield. I, I, I hardly dare utter these words because I know even there there is a lot of uh, conflict or places that are underdeveloped and for some reason or other want to be given some, some sort of economic development. The trouble though is it's radioactive waste and it's a no-no. I mean, people for, for nuclear power stations will grab what they can. I mean, the, the, the jobs and the investment are the big issue here and people see a positive in that. Mostly, people do not see a positive in, in radioactive waste. Do you, as a social and scientist, and you take... Can I make just one other point though, and that is... Why aren't we thinking of compensating those places that already are housing it? Why is it just these new places? And why aren't we going to be giving um, lots of money to new build sites which will have spent fuel on them, which they've not had before? I mean, the argument seems to me ethically no different, um, that you ought to be compensating those areas if in the end you foist something on them that they don't want, then, you know, the compensation issue arises, it seems to me. Do you take the point, is, is it Brendan, is that your name, that he made that if local government were given the finance to educate the local population in terms of the impact it may or may not have on the community, that perhaps it would be more attractive? Well, I think local government has got a big role in that respect. And you might find that when this process actually starts, that there will be local authorities coming forward who actually are trying to lead it. It'll mm. still be very controversial within those communities. Um, I just think it is going to be a long time and very hard to actually get somewhere to take it. And you have to look in this country, was it 73% of the radioactivity is here in Sellafield. Um, that will look to everybody as the place where something has got to happen because otherwise you're going to spread this stuff all over the place and that's going to cause a, a few roars. So there is already a deep-seated problem politically and that is going to be resisted and possibly the geology is not right and so on. So in this country, I think the situation is far more complex than in, say, Sweden, which has got a piddling amount of the stuff. It's all spent fuel and the repositories are all going to be built um, on the coast in, in, in granite. I mean... And, and there's trust for the regulators and all the rest of it. None of these things apply here. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Gentleman here. Yeah, my question was for James, really. In, in, uh, in terms of how the technology is progressing... So, sorry. Um, my name's Colin Wales, Cumbria Trust and NTW Europe. There's a question for James. You mentioned um, about opportunities for waste. And I've been following the... Um, what Dr. Tom Scott has been doing at Bristol um, with diamonds and compacting radioactive graphite into diamonds, which are little tiny batteries. And I just wondered where that's all going to go. Um, it's well known that w we have a problem with repositories in terms of gas generation for the first thousand years. And it just seemed to me that opportunities may exist to decarbonise what goes into um, a repository, uh, if indeed anything does at all. I just wonder what your thoughts were on how we take advantage of these discoveries and what that might mean for communities such as this that have the radioactive waste. Thank I mean, you. First of all, I think NDA is very supportive of innovation and innovation in terms of development. I think we also have to recognise sort of um, the timing of development and how that will fit into our program as well. So I think we're always on the lookout for um, new technologies and how they can support the program. So we're very interested in how 
we could, um, for example, minimise waste volumes full stop, how we make uh, waste more passively safe. So that whole technology has to be, I think, looked at and investigated, but at the same time, we have to make progress. So we have to get on with the job in the near term and, and in parallel, look at those alternatives as well. But we have to see the clear benefit over um, the existing baseline we have. And also the site licensed companies are obliged to look at the best available technique. And we know that uh, technologies develop over time. So I'm personally open to new technologies, but we have to deploy them in this world as well. And they have to be affordable. Um, so all these other factors need to come in, and uh, the NDA does directly sponsor R&D, but not just that, that, the site licence companies do as well. So it's about that, how we deploy such technologies, how mature they are uh, as part of the process. Um, as as we've already said, we're talking about a long period of time here. Uh, I would say as well that we're probably a little bit different from other countries in terms of waste management, because we, deal, we do deal with mixed waste quite a lot, which makes it a bit more difficult to isolate those waste streams which may be more amenable to um, the sort of thing you're talking about. Anyone else in the panel want to add? I just that? wanted to agree with it. I mean, whenever I hear the NDE speak in forums like this, I think, yeah, they're on the ball here. They know what they're doing. Um, you know, you go away and you begin to wonder to some extent. But, I mean, <laughs> from what, what, what I've heard today, and it's very reassuring because I agree with you. I think what I've been trying to set out is it's going to take a long time. However fast you want to do it, it's still going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. Let us recognise that. But use that time for the sort of thing you were talking about, getting, getting some passive safety in as we have to store it. And we are saying to the future, you're going to have to take some responsibility for this. We don't, you know, we'll, we'll do what we possibly can. But that is, that's the fact, that the, the fact of the matter. Um, and also exploring as we go other options. I mean minimising the waste, putting it in safely, uh, maybe partitioning transmutation, I don't know what the possibilities are there. All of these things are possible. Um, a, a geological disposal looks, seems to me at this juncture one of a number of possible options. I mean, it may be one we have to use for certain types of waste, but there may be other things. We have to move forward slowly, and I think empirically that is the fact. We do have to understand this that for social reasons and physical reasons, in this country, it's going to take a, a lot longer than we may currently think. Okay. I mean, the idea we're going to have a repository by 2040, ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. 2075, I think, doubtful. Maybe the next century, I don't know, it's a long way off. Okay. Can I just uh, sure. comment on that? I mean, because I absolutely agree with, with that. It will take time to develop geological disposal and have the right solution for those wastes that require geological disposal. <coughs> but I come back to the, the point that, that James made very eloquently earlier, that the vast majority of the radioactive wastes that we generate in this country do not need geological disposal. But actually we have created a culture of filling up our cupboards and waiting for a geological disposal facility to come. Actually the principles that govern safe final disposal are the principles of the environmental safety case. We can make those cases and actually whilst we should take the time to deliver the geological disposal solution, we shouldn't take the time where we have those other opportunities available to us and we should get on and deliver. So, yeah, fine, take the time on the one hand, on the other hand, actually let's get to it. There's lots you can be cracking on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, question from over here. Malcolm Linden from Oldbury SSG. Um, the, the driver is already there to need a deep geological disposal facility as Corwin decided and the government have taken on board that that's the way that it's going to go. So uh, we've seen it going round and round a bit in the last few years where we've uh, tried it, had questionnaires, answered things as some of my colleagues know well. Um, but I have a direct question relative to what's going into this. I understand that Sellafield has quite a significant volume of waste already packaged, suitable for a deep geological disposal facility, um, and that there are questions within the current uh, waste streams coming out of the decommissioning sites as to how waste should be packaged, and uh, this is a bit political, the different types that have been considered. Uh, I would like to know whether the ones in Sellafield are leading to the decision as to what types, i.e. Uh, ductile cast iron or reinforced concrete, is the best way forward uh, in the current climate. 
and are they all suitable? Because they're not approved, as I understand it, yet by the regulator. Could you give us some forward guidance on what might happen? Andrews, maybe a question for you. Sorry, James, question for you. <laughs> I'll hand over to Anne as well. But um, first of all, the RWM have a letter of it's called a letter of compliance process, and I'm sure Anne can talk about it for a long time. But it's there to give advice and guidance to our site license companies how to uh, package the waste. And RWM own that process, and that ensures compatibility with the geological disposal facility um, as the concept. And the point being that a cellar filled waste that meets the requirements of the, of the letter of compliance is the same process as Magnox or any other site. Um, I think we have to be aware, we often talk about intermediate level waste as a single entity where there is a very broad range of streams, not in term, not just in how it looks, but things like radio, um, radioactivity as well. And that letter of compliance process has to consider all those. So the point is there is a process, um, it's scrutinized by the regulators as well, and it supports the development, development of the concept for a GDF. I'm sure Anne, you might want to add a few more words, but that's the, the basis, the starting point. I mean, effect effectively, that, that is true. We have the letter of compliance process. It actually takes place in stages. So they can come at a very early stage just thinking about the, the concept of what, how to retrieve waste, and then we, we actually develop the, the detail with them. There are about 70,000 packages in stores at the moment which actually have a final letter of compliance, which means they are compatible with the plans for the GDF. So there's a, an amount so far. Um, we're packaging thousands of packages a year as the NDA decommissions its various sites, so that's increasing all the time. Your question about ductile, cast iron and or concrete, um, we can actually accommodate both provided it actually meets the requirements of the, the safety case in terms of whether or not, because the packages are effectively the first barrier in the, um, in, in the repository. So as long as they are packaged in compliance with our waste package specs and guidance, they actually form the first part, and we do. We have issued uh, final letters of compliance for ductile cast iron containers and for the cement thin walled containers as well. So, so we're we're trying to be as accommodating as possible to, to new innovation, um, but you know, recognising that there is a need to standardise on packages as we as we go forward. Okay. How many more questions have we got left, gentlemen here? Oh, sorry, just there. Thank you, Sam Usher from Dune Ray. Uh, we've heard about the, the long timescales of this. We've seen what progress has been made over the last 40 years. We've heard hundreds of years, thousands of years for the, the safety, hundreds of years to implement um, a GDF. Uh, it's difficult to, for us to actually relate to those timescales. I'd like to ask each of the panel members to think about coming back here in 10 years' time and explain to us what progress you think will have been made, whether that be from policy, infrastructure, um, or arrangements with communities. That's a great question. Uh, let's start with you then, Philippe. In 10 years, how will things be looking <laughs> in the okay. UK? Now, how much will the global picture have changed? Yeah, well, the, I, I don't want to get involved in the <laughs> UK discussions. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, otherwise, I'm that guy from the continent who comes and sticks his nose in your affairs. No, you sort it out yourselves. Um, I think, as I said, the, from a science and engineering point of view, these concepts are really becoming very mature. So in terms of getting, making great improvements there, I think we are actually almost there in having concepts that can be implemented in a safe way. So it's now rather a matter of actually start doing it. So I think it will be a matter of making progress in citing these facilities. And I hope in 10 years' time we can say that Finland has started. Well they have a license, so they should have started. France normally will have started in 10 years. Uh, Canada will have started. And Switzerland uh, hopefully has a, a site by then because they're narrowing down their site. So I think the big, hopefully, leap forward we can make in the next 10 years is that the list of countries that have actually cited the facility will have been expanded. Okay, Juliet, do you think your department will exist in 10 years? <laughs> 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 a 
Hale have been renamed Even about three one. times. Yeah, 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 we might have a new name. Uh, hey, listen, you know, by that time, I want us to have a coherent policy framework yeah. in place. And what does that mean? It means we stop prevaricating over what the particular label is that we apply to radioactive waste. We have clear leadership and governance for a national program for radioactive waste management that gives us the, the centre of excellence and the skills to drive better radioactive waste management across both nuclear and non-nuclear sectors, that we get the standardisation. We have thoughts in our head about how we deliver more centralised and regional approaches to delivering radioactive waste solutions. Do you feel like there's an understanding at government level of the, the, the urgency when it comes to disposal? It's getting there. Okay. That's your job at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Working on it. And what about you? What do you think? A decade from now, what will we, we be sat here saying? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that it's not just me that's sat here. It would be various representatives of communities in the same way that Mayor Spangenberg and Mayor Vallund actually attend these sort of things and talk about why they're involved in the process, what benefits they've seen <coughs> from it, what things are happening in their communities, lots more of the sort of projects that uh, we, took, we heard about this morning with the coffee van outside, but you know, much more of those sort of things. And that um, we've, we've tapped into a lot of our sister organisations and there's a lot more of an international feel to the whole thing. So we put ourselves on the, on the world stage, but it's not just shall we say, representatives of the industry, but it's a, a, lot, a lot wider community that's talking about the excitement, shall we say, of, uh, of developing a GDF. So, Andrew, in 10 years, we'll have a coherent strategy with a lot of excitement and optimism about, around it, well, right? Well, excitement thing is the thing that has intrigued me today. Um, I'm glad to hear that people are excited about the prospect of a, of a repository, but it's not just around the corner. Um, I mean, 10 years uh, was offered. I mean, 10 years is a nanosecond in terms of this, this stuff. And the real problem is getting your heads around the timescales. Because the predictions that are being made are for the middle of the next century. I mean, this is routinely in government documents. By the middle of the next century, we'll have done this, that, and the other. By the middle of the next century, we don't know about institutional controls. Um, we don't even know about the physical condition of the various nuclear sites. It's, it's a massive problem. So I see this as a process. I don't see it as, you know, we'll, we'll have done this by then. Because that process is necessarily slow for social and physical reasons. And it may be that we'll be, we'll be doing different things in 10 years' time. Maybe that, you know, repositories um, have a kind of different role and function. And there, there are other methods of managing it. I simply don't know. I, all I think we can say is that in 10 years' time, we shall be having discussions about the process of managing radioactive waste for the far future. And by definition, that is always going to be the pace if you do it in, 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 in 10 year lots. But it, it, it does demand of us thinking rather differently than we have. I mean, with the nuclear industry, you've got a surefire bet. It will always cost more and it will always take longer. And so you have to understand that, I mean, the timescale thing, I think, and I've been delighted today to hear, we've opened up on this question of timescales, because we've got to be honest about it and try and understand it better. But in a decade from now, James, people will want to have seen progress. What, what do you see that progress? Well, I, I mean, I'd come from um, several directions here. I think one, in terms of the, when we talked about the legacy ponds and silos at Cellar, for example, I'd like that to be proper business as usual in terms of it becomes almost routine. Yeah. We're retrieving the waste, we're dealing with the waste. I think 10 years from now, the whole debate on disposal high activity waste has to move on substantially. It'd be great 10 years from now, I know where the GDF would be, wouldn't that be fantastic? I understand the challenges there, but I think we've got to have a, I think pressure in the system about moving this debate forward, so we'll be back here in 10 years talking about the same thing. And from my own personal world of, I think a, a, a broader appreciation, and I will you know, look upon this personally, of how do we get some of these key messages out to a wider audience with respect to waste management. And remembering that GDF is not the only solution out there. Yeah. We, we talked about a lot, we've had some questions on technology exactly. development. Uh, we talked about the disposals happening now, the whole waste management thing, and, and how it all links together. I think a broader appreciation there would be really good as well. a wider public understanding, Absolutely, yeah. And um, was there a lady down here, did you want to ask a question? No. <laughs> it was there somebody at the front here. Yes, who oh, yes, go on. Uh, yes, my name's George Smythe. I'm from Dungeness. I'm wondering when we're ever going to get the details of this GTF business, because we have had presentations over the years and nothing happened. So I then come and listen to a 
very good lecture up here, but it was the same sort of vein of the one I had three years ago. And there's been no kind of publication which lets the local authorities, the local communities, start to understand. And my second point really is, is that I listened to the professor and he's very convincing, but what is the solution if we aren't going to do this? I mean, is it going to pile up at Bradwell? You know, or is it going to pile up somewhere else and nothing happens? And so I think we need to be a bit more realistic. I would like to see something positive put on the table saying, if you want to look at GDF, this is what is on the table, and this is the disadvantages, and this is the advantages. And if we're not going to have a GDF, what is the solution? Okay. Andrew, I'll come to you because, yeah. Can I just answer yep. that? I don't, I don't think I was actually, I don't think you heard me say we're not going to have a GDF. I mean, I just at this stage don't know. But I think, you know, it is, it, is, it is further off than people think. And as my colleague here says, there are various other things that are going to happen. Is it going to pile up at Bradwell? For, well, I personally uh, <laughs> would, would hope not. But to take Bradwell and any Magnox site, Bradwell is the first to go into care and maintenance. But actually, it is already a radioactive waste management site. I mean, you've got uh, intermediate level store there. And you've also got um, the um, graphite reactors. And really, frankly, the NDA don't, or do they? Perhaps they'll tell us in a minute. Do you know what you're going to do with these graphite reactors? You've said they're going to be gone by the end of the, uh, the I mean, the, the graphite cores, but by the end of the century. But I don't believe this. I, I really don't think you know. And my, my argument is do all the things that you're saying, because I think what you've set out is actually the logical way forward. So it's not a question of, will we have a reactor, sorry, a depository, or won't we have a depository? It's a fact that we actually don't know, but we've got to continue moving forward in a more progressive way, slowly maybe, but also looking at all the innovations on the way that we can, and solve those problems that we haven't solved. I mean, I think, I think dealing with the graphite cores... Yeah. You keep on, I mean, we've just heard you say we've got to plan it, Out of, inter well, out of interest, do. Where, where, where do you think, you they obviously do. feel frustrated that you, this is going That's in circles, where do you think we, the book should stop? We talk to our local communities and run our SSGs. <sighs> we can't give them the answers. Because there aren't any. On GDF, which we have had on a number of occasions, have come and done these presentations, have been very good, but we don't move forward. And but we do. There must be a system within the NDA which says in the end, or DEFRA or whoever's going to run with it, this is, this is the guideline. No. Is this an issue of communication then, if progress is being made, but people like this gentleman don't feel they know what's going on? Is that down to the government, Juliet, to make sure that people I, sure. do I feel that they're I being communicated with? Yeah, I, I, I'm certainly hearing that. Um, th there's been an, an awful lot of work going on to actually prepare ourselves for the next uh, relaunch, as it were, of the, the process in looking for geological disposal. We're, we, we've been having a number of, of facilitated events with, with groups around the country, um, and, and so my apologies if that's not involved you. And, I, I, and it is frustrating because our work has been delayed, and, and my colleague Craig uh, spoke earlier this morning about some of the, yeah. the reasons for that. But we are looking to launch later this year consultation on the, uh, the national policy statement, mm -hmm. uh, to be sharing some of the, the, the thoughts that have emerged from the, the working group we've established on how to work with community, how to think about sharing some of the messages about uh, uh, the benefits or otherwise of geological disposal. And I know RWM have done a, a vast amount of work in, in thinking about the national geological uh, screening that's taken place. So. I, I understand your frustration, but at the same time, I think within government, we're very keen that when we start this process, we are all ready to start this process and that we go forward confidently. And, and I was um, delighted to hear Marianne's uh, comment earlier this morning about that need for some of the wider engagement and support, because as we go out and we want to start exploring opportunities for geological disposal, 
You know, let's not have in our mind RWM trundling around the country in the RWM bus. This needs to be a national conversation yeah. that takes place, founded on some good quality education, advice and communication. Are we there yet? No, I don't think we are. So let's, let's make sure we, we are ready when we, the time is right to go out with that. And meanwhile, uh, signposts along the way that this is still happening. I think that's the key, isn't yeah. it? Making sure you can still feel the pulse of, of, of progress. Let's take a question here. Thank you. Yes, in 10 years' time, Marianne from the Science of Stakeholder Group, I'd like to feel that it is a national conversation. Um, and this morning I did say, don't rush ahead with the consultation. So unlike George, he wants to know how deep it will be and where it will be. And I, I want people, first of all, to know what it is. And I'd like our teenagers now in high school to be studying it and to understand because they're going to be the custodians in the future and they need to be engaged so we need to start that conversation now. Um, in terms of, uh, I thought it was interesting that Anne said that only a minimal amount will go to the GDF which by definition then says the rest of it is going to be in situ storage. So I think we need to think a little bit more about that and to recognise that what Andy said that a lot of places are already storing spent fuel uh, longer than we thought we would have to. And so it is about looking at proper solutions for communities where we're doing the interim storage and perhaps where stuff won't go to the GDF ever. And that influences our end states. And for many years and many community representatives have had conversations with the NDA and others about, okay, what's your likely end state going to be? What, what was the community like to achieve and what can the community contribute to UK PLC going forward? And I think, you know, there's a lot more out there we need to talk about. And don't forget the fact that the longer we go on before we have a GDF, the longer other communities are already storing this. And you said that three things are needed for a GDF. The fourth thing is that we need to talk about transport routes and actually donating sites. You need conversations with sites that are okay. then retrieving this and sending it, but where in the country might those transport routes be? Okay. Nina, could I pick up on... Marianne, I mean, there are lots of points in that, but I, I wanted to pick up particularly, we, we, we spoke there about this, this issue of minimising what goes to a geological disposal facility, and, and I think, as Anne says, if, if you know, we haven't even got a geological disposal facility, so if ever there was going to be a precious resource, it will be that. Diversion does not mean simply storage, because our policy is that we want safe final disposal. Okay, so diversion means that you are providing a, a, a safe environment for that disposal in some other means. In other words, you've, you've got some other facility available where it doesn't need to go for geological disposal. It's, it's been engineered in some fashion. Or perhaps you've looked more closely at the waste and you've recognised it doesn't need that level of protection that, that uh, might be needed. It, it's not an excuse for procrastination and, and storage. I was going to say, oh, sorry, just, just to add to that, the example I gave is like the decontamination aspect of it, which is you can decontaminate, put it through another route. I agree with Juliet. Please, I uh, hope I, I wasn't a bit, maybe I was a bit unclear. I didn't mean that it would actually stay at the various sites. Disposal is, is the plan. It's just actually making sure it's disposed of at the in the right routes and treated the right ways. Just like LLWR, I've had that success with that earlier slide that James showed of diverting it so that um, we actually find other means of treating the waste if we get a better understanding of the waste. Just, just quickly to say as well that um, when we talk about the uh, white paper for geological disposal, there's a part within it that asks both NDA and RWM to um, carry on investigating alternatives. And uh, recently, uh, RWM have published a report on the alternatives. It was published in April this year. So we are monitoring the situation outside as well and investigating the, the possibilities there. So it's not all about GDF being the answer of everything. This is a, 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 a program approach where we do continue to monitor and investigate alternatives. Okay. Right. We've probably got time for three more oh, questions. Can I? Excuse me. Oh. I to say we, ju we just need to okay, right. crack on with the questions or people won't get a chance to ask. There we go, the gentleman at the back. Um, thanks, it's great to get an opportunity to speak. Um, Councillor Mark Deary is my name. I'm from County Louth in the Republic of Ireland, and um, I've, you know, would be known locally for my 
uh, consistent um, opposition to the development of the nuclear industry. Um, so just so people are clear about that. Um, I, uh, the relationship between Ireland and Britain has been long and difficult and has got immeasurably better in, in recent decades, immeasurably so. And the major constitutional questions are now, there's a framework in place in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, I, I see the, legacy, the nuclear legacy issue as, as an outstanding one. There aren't many, but I do see it as one as a neighbouring country. That's my perspective, and I wouldn't be alone in that. And I think it would have been really helpful today if, if the government were here, the Irish government, um, and perhaps colleagues here from Wales and Scotland might feel the same about their own, uh, their own um, assemblies. Um, so to me, it isn't perhaps as open a debate or a dialogue as it might have been. That's, um, I, think, I hope that's, that comes across as a fair comment. Um, and I, I was reminded of, we, as you pro Ireland crashed in, in 2010 very severely, we had uh, the Troika um, into basically, um, the country was in receivership effectively. And one of the reports that came afterwards by a Professor Nyberg, a Finnish uh, finance uh, analyst, uh, was the power of groupthink. You can never be too careful about the assumptions that aren't spoken. And I'm hearing them um, as an outsider. I'm hearing them. Um, and I'd be happy to itemize them <laughs> um, in time. And when I look at, for instance, the, persistent, the persistence around Hinkley Point, when it, when it was with a strike price that to me makes no sense, and where you have very, very significant developments um, around how generation, I know we're not on generation here, might happen in the future. It, it seems to me that's, that's a red alert. There are, there, there, there are, on, there, there are uh, 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 sorry, a red flag. Um, there are assumptions there that, that need to be challenged. I can't explain it otherwise, why, why, why that would, decision would be persisted with. Um, on, on the waste issue, um, it does feel like uh, a threat that hasn't sufficiently been answered. Um, and there are lots of intermediate problems. The, the discussion here has been dominated by the, the issue of uh, underground disposal. Um, but the, the more immediate concerns for people like myself and um, others um, it, are, are issues around the, the actual safety of, 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 of the current repositories, the waste tanks, um, the regulatory environment around them. So um, and I would have a question for from I, I would have liked that, 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 that debate to, to have been you know, on, on more, more pressing and more immediate issues, okay. although I appreciate the long term. So that would be a question. Um, um, and, and to what extent the Office for Nuclear Regulation will be affected and its capacity to oversee, oversee will be affected by, um, by Brexit and, okay. and, and things like that, yeah. Okay. That's an interesting one. The impact of Brexit then. Because we've heard about how knowledge has been shared internationally, how we've relied on partners in Europe. Do you see Brexit? I'll come to you um, as an international spokesman, Philippe. Yeah. Um, do you see it as having a significant impact? Okay, the, the B word is out. Uh, the B word's yeah, out yeah. there. It's happened. Um, well, I don't have anything. <laughs> yeah, we've got okay. five minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what Brexit will mean mm -hmm. to this program, but in terms of collaboration with what you called and the sister organizations, I don't think that's going to have any effect. Okay. I think these relations are good to very good. There's a very... I, I don't think there's a lot of other industries where there's so much sharing of knowledge and expertise as in this nuclear waste management industry. This is because the lack of commercial goals, probably. Uh, there are not of many, uh, well, it's all waste management organizations that rather run with public money. So I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much open sharing. So I think that's just going to continue. Okay. I don't see And are the rest yeah. of you optimistic that Brexit won't have an impact on that information sharing? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Uh, uh, can I just, just make, make clear that you know, we remain absolutely committed, certainly to those obligations to which we've signed up within the International Atomic Energy um, Conventions, much of which is then reflected through Euratom, the Euratom Treaty, and, and into our, our current legislative arrangements. As we go through Brexit, what we're looking to do is to, to mimic anything that might not already be enshrined in UK legislation 
into our UK legislation so that we retain those arrangements in place. Now, there's going to be effort needed in, in plugging some of the gaps where, for yeah. example, at the moment we rely on a safeguard system, and that's where uh, the Office for Nuclear Regulation is, is being given some of those powers to resource up and to, to address that. So the challenge of Brexit is, is, is the, for the industry is, is, is simply about, I think, some of that, that turmoil in putting those arrangements in place. But there is, is no change to our, our, um, our commitment to ensuring the same standards and the obligations are, are being met. Uh, that remains the case. Sure. Do you feel reassured by that? I agree with you, sir. I, mean, I think that's the biggest challenge, it, which is understanding where then it are, is the hook in terms of ensuring you have access to appropriate enforcement uh, and recourse to details. And I haven't got a, a solution to that, but it's very much uh, something we recognise and is on our radar that we need to understand and ensure that we have those mechanisms in place. Andrew. I don't want to answer the Brexit question, but I do want to address what you said before that. Uh, and also to reflect on what Marianne has uh, also said earlier. It seems to me, I mean, I don't get excited very easily, and I'm only partially excited now, but I, I, have, <laughs> I, I have reflected on this afternoon's discussion in particular, and it seems to me that we are in a somewhat different place to what I thought, where I thought we would be. I mean, up to now, the, the repository has been a kind of holy grail of everything. And that, I think, has been a problem in terms of looking at radioactive waste management for the longer term. And my colleague here, for example, has pointed out that a lot of other things are happening. Marianne has said we need to discuss, as we do, the whole thing that's going on on the various sites and so on. Because there's a lot going to happen in the next few decades to do with existing modes of waste management and what we should be doing and what we have to try and get answers to and alternatives are coming up with the way that we manage it and so on. So let us put the repository back in its box to an extent as part of the process, as something out there that we will strive towards at the moment because it does look the best possible, it looks the best long term, but it's not the only thing. Yes. The game is much wider than that. I think the, you know, the various site people have to recognize this. We, we do have issues and, and I think the NDA are struggling towards somehow to giving some sort of solutions to that, but we need to know a lot more from them about this, I think, on you know how we're gonna deal with the graphite, for example, uh, and so on. And it is a process, and it will take time, and if we're gonna be fair to the next generations, into general equity, we've gotta deal with all these storage matters as well. Okay, we've probably got time for two <coughs> more, because we are running out of time, here we go. And then, was there someone over there that's had their hand up? Oh, okay. And you can be the last one. Thank you. Paul Lenatovich from the Isle of Man, the place you can see just across the water there. We're not actually part of the UK. Um, notwithstanding the last comment about geological um, disposal, um, bearing in mind that this material is going to be a problem for millennia, which means civilizations will have come and gone. We can't imagine that we are still going to be around at that time. It's going to be some other civilization beyond us, I guess. Um, so the place that's chosen for it is absolutely crucial that it's suitable. And shouldn't it be the case that the geology should come first in deciding where things are disposed of and then look for volunteers in the right places rather than volunteerism and then trying to find a solution in the ones that do volunteer? Yeah, I'll, and I'll that's that. probably a good one for you. That, that, that is... Uh, I haven't spoken yet. <laughs> that, that is one of the, um, that is one of the, the, the changes, if you like, and the, the idea of the, the new process, which is, as was mentioned, I think, this morning. I don't know what's happening with my mic. Is it? Is that your feedback? Oh, is it? Is that what it is? OK. Um, sorry. The, the intent is we're, we're undertaking an exercise to do the national geological screening, which is to take all of the uh, data that the British Geological Survey actually hold on the UK at the moment and actually um, get it all out on the table um, within the 13 regions that the BGS actually use as, as the means of dividing up the UK. So these are not regions that we've put down. These are regions that the, the BGS actually holds data on. And the idea is to get all of that information out there at the launch of the process so that we can actually start to have discussions with 
anybody about where there are potential sites or where there are areas where there is rock that we're interested in underneath those areas potentially just based on the data that is available at the moment so we're not doing any new surveys we haven't done any new investigations this is purely gathering all that information available so that when we actually start to discuss with communities and we actually get the process launched we can actually have a proper debate as you say with the geology first that says yes there is suitable geology under your area or there is not before anybody puts any sort of political um, credibility on the line as it were right. does that answer your question yeah, good just, okay final question to the gentleman here Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, I'll let Morris Jones will of ISSG. I, I, I liked what the professor said about the comparison with the Holy Grail. We do know that the Holy Grail was never discovered, but put that to one side. <laughs> what, what I would really like to know from governor, government representatives, because all our communities would like to know roughly what kind of time frame we are looking at at the end of the beginning so that we do reach a GDF in the end. The professor has told us it won't happen by the turn uh, of the end of this century. I've heard no, no one challenge him so far, but I'm interested in hearing gov government views on that subject. Thank you. Well, well this feels, it feels like it encapsulates a lot of what the day's been about. Um, yeah, when are we getting there? Are we going to get there? Our can, we, can we put a time scale We will have geological disposal from 2040s. 2040s. And for, for spent fuel disposal from the 2070s. Now, I'm, I'm sticking to that time okay. scale. And, and I want you all to come and, and stick to that time scale and, and actually help create that process. I'm actually astonished, but there we are. Um, can I, but I want to say something, because timescales has been a big issue today. I'm very pleased about that, and we're starting to think about that. But the question has just come up about, you know, shouldn't we be looking at the geology? And I would just say to people, be careful what you wish for. Because if you do it that way, then, you know, places will be uh, isolated and uh, you won't know about the community side. I think the two do have to come together. Because we're dealing with two axes. We're dealing with intragenerational equity and we're dealing with intergenerational equity. So the, the voluntarism is, it seems to me, important in the present context in that we do need uh, communities that are willing to participate in the present generation. So you have to have that side of it. On the geology, of, this is where the intergenerational equity issue comes in. We need to have places that are sort of safe forever because actually nobody can possibly say what's going to happen in a million years' time, which is what these things are, are programmed for. And we're, we're basically going to let the future take care of itself. That's what we're going to do. So therefore, we better make sure that if it's going to take care of whatever that future is in a million years' time, just think about that. We're not a clue, are we? Um, uh, I mean, they may all be robots by then anyway. Uh, but I think, you know, to get, the, to get the thing, you've got to do the two together. The, the social and the physical, the intergenerational and the intergenerational. And there's, there's nothing you've heard today that's made you revise your view that that's not possible in the next century. What's not possible? Get, uh, finding a space. For well, I don't space. think that's the only issue. Is the point I've been trying to make. There's a whole lot of other things, and I, and I don't think at the end of the no, I don't personally. I think okay. it'll be a long time. I think you know, if we get a repository, it's going to be much later than people think. I mean, okay. 2040 seems to me hopelessly optimistic. But James. So the point is, we that the planning the planning assumption is for intermediate level waste is 2040, and there's a process to go through. I've just heard a couple of times the, the, the conversa conversation about graphite. To be clear, the graphite is a waste stream, and our current <laughs> position is that material will also end up in a a GDF, but also around about that conversation with graphite is one of those waste streams which we talked about the broad range which is intermediate level waste. A lot of the graphite is right at the bottom of ILW and actually some of it is low level waste as well. It's nothing special, it is a high volume stream absolutely, but it's not a special case. The, uh, so we just need to understand that context. It's just mentioned a couple of times. So the solution for the Magnots graphite is a GDF as well at this moment in time. Philip, you've seen solutions evolve around the world. Oh, is it realistic to say 2040s here in the UK? Well, again, I won't comment on the UK because I don't know your situation. <laughs> you can call me a coward, but I'm going to shy <laughs> no, away I from don't that. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> but I think internationally, yes, that's you've perfectly seen it possible. Before. Yes, yep. yes, yes, yes. I just wanted to comment on one thing you said that over a million years we cannot predict the future. That's completely true when we talk about our societies and, and, uh, and, and the surface. 
when we talk about deeply underground and geological environments, and I'm here to promote geological disposal, but a million years is also a nanosecond for a geological yes, process. Because that's the core of geological disposal, is that over a million years, these environments are very, very, very stable. Uh, not all environments, but some environments are. So that's why we look for geological disposal. That's just one okay, thing I want to say. Final word from you, Anne. 2040, is that 20, realistic? 2040 is still the, the planning assumption. As we, uh, as you'll be aware, we keep our plans under, under review all the time and uh, in discussion with the NDA about how that meets with the, um, the NDA's plans for, for de decommissioning sites and actually um, taking things forward. There are scenarios where 2040 would be possible. There's also scenarios where it could be a lot longer than 2040. So I think if you were looking at any major program and looking at infrastructure programs and how you actually plan them and do your probability, you know, the, your program probability of 10, 50, 80 percent, you can get a range of uh, a range of outcomes. But I do think the one important thing is that just because it takes a long time, it's not the reason to defer it. It just seems to me as as though people are saying, "Oh, it'll take a long time, so let's not bother." Yeah. I think, you know, the one lesson that we find from looking at the overseas people, it's like what I call the hare and the tortoise sort of idea. Mm -hmm. They've plodded on very, very steadily, built up a head of steam, built. You know, put a lot of effort into building um, relationships with various people and communities and governments and building confidence in the whole system. And the sooner you start that and the more you actually put your effort and accelerate into that, the, the more the programme will go. But just because it takes a long time is not the reason not to bother. I think that's a good note to end on. And hopefully today's discussions will feed into the big jigsaw and move everything forward. Thank you so much for having me today. I really enjoyed it. Well done to the panel.